Welcome, everybody, to the 2023 Redlands Area Historical Society meeting for this year, first meeting of this year. This sounds really good, Nathan. I don't know what's going on, or I'm not echoing it or anything. Like anyway, um, I'm kind of excited about this particular presentation because I love maps. And I love Redlands maps, and I love how much information they can tell me. I also know that they lie sometimes, because uh, Frank Brown in 1882 drew a map of Redlands looking down from Redlands Heights, and he showed his house, and he showed what would be Cypress and Center Street, and he showed a telephone line going to his house on West Cypress Avenue. That telephone line wasn't built until the following year. And then he had a railroad connection going down uh, West Cypress Avenue, down Winery Grade, going all the way down to the Southern Pacific platform, which wasn't built until 1883. So he added a few things, okay? But other features on his map, I later found out were be quite true. He had the Stillman property with the vineyards. He had the military Zaha flowing where it actually flows. Of course, uh, the mountains, he just, you know, doesn't matter how many peaks you have. He just put the mountains wherever he wanted to. The first good map for the downtown area is 1890, and that's by Isaac Ford. Of course, he was city engineer when he did that. And that 1890 map showed the boundaries of Red and all the interior streets and everything else at that time. It's very well done. Railroad maps uh, were concerned about right away all the owners along the area that they were going to have to purchase property and get transfer deeds. So Southern Pacific gave, gave us some really good maps along the Southern Pacific right away all the way to Crafton and all the owners at that time. So I'm really looking forward to this program because as I said, I love maps. My wife would tell you that I have about 2000 maps upstairs. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a lot of maps. I have every map of the San Bernardino National Forest even before there was a San Bernardino National Forest. So there you go. Um, I don't know, they might've put out one recently and I don't have the new stuff, but I have all of the old stuff that goes with it. And then all the other uh, Sanborn maps. The Sanborn maps had to be accurate because they're based for insurance. And so downtown Redlands was covered extensively, showing what buildings were wood, what buildings were brick. And so I have really good, uh, good coverage of the Sanborn maps. Now getting into the neighborhoods, Sanborn company didn't always cover all the neighborhoods because uh, they were looking for where they could sell insurance and they wanted to know where the, where the wood homes were, the two-story homes were, and where that could be any of the brick houses and stuff of that nature. So I'm gonna introduce Ron Running, our vice president who is going to introduce our program. But I wanna take a quick poll first, because I bet you I'm the only one here in the audience can say this. How many of you have had a doctor in your brain? Raise your hand. Doctor inside your brain? Nobody, okay? How many have had a doctor inside your heart? Got one person back there, two people, three, four, five, wow. Well, I'm the only person who's got both. That's why I'm standing here today because I wasn't able to stand last year because tachycardia, they had to zap a little nerve inside my uh, heart. And when they did that, now I can stand and I don't feel dizzy. And I can go to the backyard and not worry about where I'm going to fall. It's really, it's really quite good. It's really positive thing. So without further ado, um, here is Ron running. Thanks, Tom. It's good to see him up in Mobile, and now we can give him more things to do for the Historical Society. Um, 
Welcome, everyone. We're, we're pleased to see so many people out tonight. We thought maybe cold weather might dampen your spirits, but uh, that's not the case when we have our uh, entire staff of the archives here tonight with us. Uh, Nathan Gonzalez, Maria Carrillo, and Katie is here, and uh, they're so helpful in all our research and uh, protecting the uh, archives um, for the city of Redlands. Uh, Nathan has been a longtime staff member. Well, Maria, they've all been uh, with the staff a long time. And uh, when we found out that they had a program on the maps, we jumped at that. So without further ado, Nathan and Maria. Thanks, Ron. And it, you're all fortunate because your program just became half because Tom gave the other half. <laughs> No, really, I want to thank you guys for, well, I want to thank the society for uh, inviting us to be here this evening. Uh, this program actually started out as a project that Maria and I have been working on that was intended originally to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the creation of the Division of Special Collections and the Heritage Room at the library. Um, and we have intended that something will eventually be published in book form, uh, but we got a little sidetracked last year. Uh, so we didn't get it finished, but we started working on things. And when when Ron called or emailed or stopped by the Heritage Room, I don't remember which, and and asked if if we had something we could do, he's like, "Hey, we've been working on this cool map thing." So I'm gonna get a seizure. <laughs> Holy moly! Okay. <laughs> now I've been I'm distracted. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope they can see the screen in person. <laughs> okay, um, so so everything in history happens somewhere, and cartography or maps are important, and these two and occasionally three-dimensional representation, representations show us what the world is around us, or historically what the world was around the people who, who drew the maps. They can reveal a lot more than just place names and streets. They can show change over time. They can be interpreted to reveal social norms or expectations and help understand why things happened the way they did, how they evolved, and what are the effects or consequences of our imposition on nature. And to move us through the early parts of history, my colleague Maria Correa. All right, good evening. Okay. So as Nathan said, I'm going to move us through the early part of history. So before we actually get to Redlands, we're going to commence by focusing on the evolution of this re region. And we'll begin our story with these maps that focus on California's earliest inhabitants. People are believed to have inhabited California for about 13,000 to 15,000 years, although recent analysis have shown that that's probably not actually absolutely accurate, it may have been much longer than that. So it has been estimated that before European contact with Native Americans, one third of the people living in what became the United States were in the West, with the majority inhabiting the area that later became known as Alta California, which is a little bit larger than what we know as California today. The tribal territories of those groups can be seen on this map on the left, while the map on the right shows the roots of the languages spoken by those early Californians. Because these areas do not follow the city and county divisions that we know now, mapping is obviously, I think, one of the most effective ways to really convey this type of information. Beyond that, these groups overlapped culturally through shared resources, trade, and family, family relations. Uh, as we know, following the arrival of Europeans, disease and violence significantly reduced the population, leading to changes in, in food supply, as well as social and physical disruption. So with the colonization of the Americas under, already underway, California remained a mystery to Europeans as late as the mid 17th century when this map was created. Has anybody ever seen this map before? Yeah. Europeans' earliest notions of California were that the region was actually an island. This belief was uh, the result of Europeans' partial exploration of Baja California, which of course makes sense when you kind of look at this map. 
The name California came from a popular 16th century novel that included a mythical island called California that was populated only by beautiful warriors who used golden tools and weapons. Map makers started using the name California to label this unexplored territory on the North American West Coast from that point on. Uh, and even after this idea of California as an island was debunked, the rumors of gold and these wealthy golden cities in, in, in that part of the world persist, persisted. So with this map, we can discuss Spain's colonization of the region that began in the later part of the 18th century with the arrival of missionaries and settlement expeditions like the Juan Bautista de Anza expedition, which is detailed here. The Anza, the Anza expedition included over 200 people, which included men, women, and children from New Spain, which of course we now know as Mexico, who were all willing to move north on foot and settle on a region that they didn't know much about and really didn't have much information. After an eight month, 2000 plus mile trip, the people arrived in San Francisco Bay in June of 1776. And so today their route is a National Historic Trail, which is managed by the National Park Service who created this map, which really effectively conveys, I think, a lot of different information about the expedition. So I kind of want to focus on this map to see the different information that we can learn from it. As explained in the map's key, it details the areas where families are recruited for the expedition. You could see that uh, with the dotted lines and the significant places where the expedition stopped, as well as identifying the various uh, tribes whose territories these travelers pass through. The map also identifies various geological features like Coyote Canyon and several rivers that they encountered along the way, as well as previously previously established missions and procedures that were already in place by the time they went through there. Locally, these travelers moved through the tribal territory of the Cahuilla and Serrano people through what is today uh, Riverside. I think this map is really just a really great example of how maps can really effectively convey different types of information and how they can be used. So that period of colonization by settlers worked in tandem with religious occupation of the region, which was achieved through the establishment of Spanish missions, which you may all be, all be familiar with, especially if you grew up in, in California. As shown by this map, California came to have 21 Spanish religious outposts with the dual purpose of, of course, evangelizing the native Californians who lived here and to aid with the expansion of of the Spanish Empire into this most northern and western parts of North America. As you probably have learned, these missions were built by Indian labor, and they brought about a total change in culture for many of the tribes with which they interacted. While we now have a greater understanding of the consequences of this period in California history, what I really think is really interesting about this particular map is the different impression that it actually gives you. So although it shares many important details about the missions of Alta California, including their proximity to the coast and to each other, to all the missions were about 30 miles from the coast, more or less, or within that. And they also talk about the geography around which they were constructed, but it also does something else. So it was created in 1949, and this map really conveys this romanticized version of this part of California's history. It uses pastoral illustrations of the mission buildings, um, and Junipero Serra, who's the missionary who's given credit for the creation of these earliest missions, as well as imposing the system of oppression that they put in place. The scroll that's in the center contains biographical information for Serra. But what of the native Californians who made this mission possible? This here is the only image within the map that really acknowledges the presence of native Californians. And even in this case, as you can see, they're shown in the midst of physical labor with a uh, missionary kind of presiding over him with their his arms in the air. Now this type of imagery and the narrative that accompanied it was not uncommon and really did shape how generations of people understood this part of history. So it's telling you a part of history, but it's also leaving you with this different type of impression, uh, which I think is really important to, to consider. 
So among the earliest missions was uh, San Gabriel, which was established in the foothills of what is now, of course, the San Gabriel Valley, and became the most productive mission in the system, an achievement that was, of course, made possible uh, by the work of the Tongva people, pardon me, who lived and worked on the site, of course. Now, the San Gabriel mission, as this artistic map shows, came to be located near the Pueblo of Los Angeles, which was founded in 1781, which was a decade after the mission was, was, was built. And that really became the social center uh, for the region in the decades that followed. Now, as part of their colonization efforts, San Gabriel's missionaries established an estancia or outpost about 60 miles east of the mission in what is Redlands today. And this happened in 1819 or about then. While the property was used to graze cattle for the mission, the Estancia also provided an outlet for missionaries to proselytize to the Cahuilla and Serrano people in this area. While the Estancia was only in use for a relative, relatively brief period of time, its impact is of course still with us in the form of the Sangha or Sankey, of course, you're all from Redlands, I should say Sankey, uh, which you all know is an irrigation canal, of course, that was created to bring water from Mill Creek to the, from in the Crafton Hills for the Estancia. Now, Nathan's gonna discuss more about the long-term significance of this project, but I'm just really quickly gonna talk a little bit about this map because it's very similar to the map that we uh, saw earlier. So here's the Estancia or an illustration of it. And then here is the whole map that the that smaller piece was taken from. So you notice it kind of hits a lot of the same notes of this romanticized version of California. It's even called Roads to Romance. Uh, and it really does celebrate this period of colonization. And whenever it shows any of California's other inhabitants or the region's inhabitants, like showing uh, Mexican people near the border, they're shown very stereotypical, um, with very stereotypical imagery. Native peoples throughout the state or, or the area are referenced just through huts, not by actually um, showing any, any people or you know, where they lived. So those types of decisions, of course, by map makers are indicative of this pervasiveness and this type of biased messaging. Now, with that, I think Nathan's going to pick up the story from here and tell us a little bit more. Sorry. Oh, she's coming back. Don't worry. Don't applaud yet. It's not over till it's over. Okay. Now, I realize we're very, very early on in history. And no, we're not going to go through every single year from 1819 or 1769 or whatever un, until today. But I did wanna mention, we got into the Spanish period, then of course the Mexican period, which follows that after the mission lands were secularized in the 1830s, then of course Mexican governors decided to give out or sell land grants. This is a map of the Rancho San Bernardino. Um, I am not a cartographer, but I would have thought I'd be able to, you know, like understand the map. I have no idea how to read this map, but it is a map of the Rancho San Bernardino, a diseño uh, of that. Um, so that was, of course, 1842 when members of the Lugo family uh, were given were were sold in part uh, the Rancho San Bernardino, which was largely the San Bernardino, parts of the San Bernardino, San Bernardino Valley and up into uh, Yucaipa, today, today's Yucaipa. Here's what the Rancho San Bernardino was mapped out as uh, after the beginning of the American period. Uh, this is from the early 1850s after the rancho was sold to a group of Mormons who had come here to establish a new colony. And so you can see in the pink, that is the outline of the, of the rancho, uh, Rancho San Bernardino. And then the city of San Bernardino was that square right up there, which was created um, by the Mormon settlers who had come here in the early 1850s. And of course, it's also the Mormons who were responsible for the creation of San Bernardino County uh, out of a much larger than Los Angeles County. But I was looking at this map and I thought, what a really bizarre shape. I mean, who does that, right? That's just very strange. And it reminded me a way of this map of Los Angeles, which of course shows, you know, that little tiny strip that goes down to next door to Long Beach. And of course, the whole purpose of that was so that the city of Los Angeles could capture the port of Los Angeles. The only reason there's that little tiny stretch it runs all the way down. So that's what made me think about that. It. It's just so weird about that other map of the Rancho San Bernardino. Um, so this is a much later map. This is from 1888. And so I'm not getting to 1888 yet, but I want to use this as an example because it actually has the outline 
of the Rancho San Bernardino on it. Um, so that is, is the shape of the Rancho. You can still see that, or that orange square, the city of San Bernardino as it was established. And then going to the east on that bizarre line. And if we look up a little closer, you can see now Redlands is this area, we, the little green squares that are on the right. So that pink strip that goes down um, is north, the northern part of Redlands and Magonia area. You know, and then of course to the east and on up. I thought still I didn't make any sense until until I drew that. And that anybody guess what that is? The little blue line, the squiggly line. That, my friends, is the Mill Creek Sankey. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to call it the Sankey, um, because many of you will remember Lois Wilson, who was a good friend and in my one of my earliest programs for the Historic Society, probably somewhere around 1999 or 2000. I thought, you know, I was right out of grad school and I was pretty hot shit and I was gonna, I was gonna tell these people their history, right? And so I was up, blah, 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 and I said, and the Mill Creek Sunha, and you guys, you remember Lois, she raised her hand. I said, yes, so she, she stood up, she said, excuse me, but in Redlands, we call it the Sankey. So lesson you learn one time in this town. Some of you were at that meeting. Susan Reddick was there. I remember Ron was probably there. You know, so I, now I've been here only 23 years and I'm still a newbie. So, so yes, they got the rancho around where there was water. So that was the Sankey. All right. So I'm going to pop it back to the, speaking of the rancho period to, uh, to Maria. Don't applaud yet. <laughs> Okay, so moving forward a little bit. So you, of course, know that California became part of the United States in 1850. Um, and very quickly, because so many people were coming here during the gold rush, there was this movement to create a state. Instead of California becoming an official territory, it became a state very early on. And while they were discussing statehood for California in the Constitutional Convention, they started discussing how to create how to divide the state. It was in territories at the time. So they decided to create counties. And this map is a little difficult to see, uh, but it shows the original counties of California. It actually shows them in 1851. So there was a little change by then. But essentially what happened is Northern California became divided into several different counties because that's where everybody was. In Southern California, you had um, a lot counties that had a lot more territory that were a lot larger. And you can kind of see it, I don't know, it's a little difficult to see in the map there, but it, in Southern California, there was just essentially a lot less division at that time. Now, Nathan mentioned earlier the creation of the city of San Bernardino, and that was preceded by the creation of San Bernardino County, which happened in 1853, and it was created out of portions of the eastern portions of Los Angeles County, so you can see that there. And of course, this happened uh, thanks to the work of the Mormon colonists who uh, purchased Rancho San Bernardino from the Lugo family uh, and became very, very much involved in state politics and local politics. And so they were the ones who really uh, worked towards creating a separate county for San Bernardino. The city, of course, came a, a year later in 1854. Now, you probably know this story. After the Mormon colonists were recalled to Utah in 1857, Dr. Benjamin Barton purchased portions of the land from the elders. And so you can see there a photograph, early photograph of the Barton property with the home. And it included the estancia, which we discussed earlier. The estancia was only in use for a very brief period of time. So by the time Dr. Barton purchased the property uh, in 1857, it was already, the, the estancia had already fallen to disrepair. The Bartons, as you may know, uh, built a vineyard, uh, which really developed into a, a lucrative wine business. And then they began selling portions of the land. And they were actually some of the first um, people to sell land to Edward Judson and Frank Brown for what would become the Redlands Colony. And that took place in 1881. Now, the map that you see here was actually created as the family was subdividing the property in 1890. So you can see there the Barton Land and Water Company. 
And now this close up of the ad provides a better view of where the property was positioned in the region. Importantly, it also shows the Zangha crossing through the property, which was, of course, a significant consideration for anyone who was interested in, in purchasing land. Uh, but the maps also interesting for this close up because it includes the land's proximity to cities, roads and train lines, all of which would, of course, been important draws as people were looking to settle in the region. Now, Tom mentioned transportation or, or railroad maps earlier, and this was a very important, uh, big selling point, of course, for people. The, the ease of travel uh, was really improving in the mid 19th century. So, of course, you have the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in May of 1869, which really transformed the way that the western part of the United States fit in with the rest of the country. Travel became much faster, more convenient, it was much easier. And as shown by this map, by the 1880s, San Bernardino was served by railroads from four directions, two of which were transcontinental. transcontinental. Uh, the Southern Pacific first made its way through San Timoteo Canyon in 1780s, or 1876, while the Santa Fe arrived about a decade later. And as demonstrated by this map, by this period, travel by rail was incredibly convenient with stops in communities throughout the region, including the mountain areas, which as the map shows were accessible via light rail. You can sort of see a thinner line going from San Bernardino up through to the mountains. Locally, the expansion of the rail system made the growth of the citrus industry possible and contributed to tourism. Of course, locally cities across the region were benefited by the competition between these rail companies and the tourism that resulted. So to tell you more about the evolution of this area of Redlands to a city, here's Nathan again. Well, just to see to see the screen, I have to take my glasses off. But to see you, I have to put them back on. So, okay. Maria mentioned the Transcontinental Railroads. One of the effects of the ease of transportation to Southern California was a land boom. And the 1880s saw the creation of many, 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 many attempts at new towns in Southern California. Um, they called it the boom of the 80s. Now, that, there were other towns, obviously, that were springing up before that. Riverside is 1869. Uh, there was this whole thing about uh, founding communities as colonies. Ontario was started as a colony. That's why if you go to Ontario, you can go to the model colony room. Uh, Riverside was started as a colony. Uh, Redlands was, was dreamt of as a colony as well. And, of course, Judson and Brown had come out separately. You know, in the 1870s, they ended up in the Lagonia area. Um, which is north of the Sankey, that area over there, in case you are unfamiliar. And, you know, tried just different kind of business things that didn't, didn't quite pan out the way that they had hoped, and then decided after they became friends that they were in business together, they're going to become uh, land developers, basically. And it was really helpful that Frank Brown was an engineer from the Sheffield School at Yale, because he could do survey work and draw maps and things like that. And so this is an early map not from 1881, but it was one of the first that really puts together all of the land that they eventually would envision uh, as the Redlands. You can see that's the plan of the Redlands. And you see these funky shapes around the top. It's not all in just rectangles. That is the northern border of the Redlands. And that section from about the middle above the K to the left or to the west, that is the boundary created by the Sankey in Redlands, the dividing line between Redlands and Lagonia was the Sankey. It wasn't the other side of the tracks or the other side of the freeway. It was the other side of the people made ditch that ran through what became the center of town. Um, but you can get a sense of the breadth of what they had envisioned for the Redlands. Now, this is obviously a much later map, but I want—I thought it was important to bring in um, a topographic map because it seems like, because we might drive it every day, we never really think about streets and why they're laid out the way that they ended up getting laid out. And the reason is not because, I, this is a great urban legend. I don't know where this came from. I can't imagine that it's possibly true. Someone told me once that, well, the streets in Redlands are laid out this way so that the sun is never in your eyes. 
<laughs> I said, clearly you have never driven down Olive Avenue at four o'clock in winter. But, okay, so, you know, we, we've got this funky street grid, right? And the streets in the southern part of Redlands that are on the hill are all turned at a, at a bizarre angle from everything that's, that's north of the Senki, basically. And the reason is, if you look at the lines on the topographic map, the streets follow the topography. Because, you know, you want water to go where it wants to go, and you're not going to fight it. If it's going to go straight down the hill, then it seems like if you're going to be managing water runoff, you're going to make your streets run that way, too, or perpendicular to them. So that's, that's the reason that our streets end up getting laid out this way, if you're ever thinking about it. I don't understand. This is why it's all about the actual physical geography of this place. So they decide to go into business together. It's 1881. They've started to assemble land, right? They're getting, getting land from Ben Barton. They're getting land from the Southern Pacific Railroad. They're getting land from other um, property owners around here. And this is the preliminary map of Redlands from 1881 which we have in the library's collection. Here it is, filed at the request of Ed Judson, November 21st, 1881. Pretty cool, right? I thought that'd be more enthusiastic. Like, man, this is freaking awesome. This is like, this is what creates Redlands. This, this is it, right? So I'm gonna back it out just so you can see, remember, the, the way that the um, property blocks are laid out are in, you know, traditional squares and rectangles that go north, south, east, west, but, but which you can see in the, in the shapes, basically, of, of how he's been able to draw. But because he's following, because Frank Brown's following the topography, right, he's laying the streets out that are obviously at a different angle to the way that those, those political boundaries had been drawn uh, earlier. And... Obviously, there's a much larger vision because this is probably what they owned at the time, I guess, and trying to figure out how it was all going to be sectioned out into lots and blocks and where the streets would eventually go. Here's what the streets are, in case you're curious. So there's this little tiny bit of olive, a little tiny bit of fern, slightly more cypress, a fair amount of palm, a little bit of island, and then Cajon Street, which runs down the, down the middle at the diagonal. That's all there was in the preliminary map of Redlands, but you got to start somewhere. Here's the second preliminary map, which takes everything that was in the preliminary map and then adds to it so we get more of the town. So here we are, and this is February 21st, 1882. Yeah. And so give you a sense, these are, now we're all the way out to San Mateo Street on the west, and there's more filled in um, in a number of the sections. So things are really moving along. And Tom mentioned this uh, in the introduction. Here we have a, an artistic rendering of what they anticipated Redlands might look like. It was published in 1882. It was published in a volume called The History of, of San Diego and San Bernardino Counties. Uh, we've got a copy of it in the collection of the library. It was reproduced. Is this one that was? No, that was maybe the 1881 Anyway, there was a reproduction of one of the books of, of the history of the county that was done. It must be the one of San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Never mind, scratch all that. That that ribbon that runs through the middle, it's the Sankey, right? Because there's water and there's trees, right? This is supposed to advertise what would be by be Redlands by Judson and Brown proprietors, and of course, Redlands in this case is the stuff that's this side of the Sankey, and he's got all the streets laid out. Tom mentioned the the intersection at, at Cyprus and Center Street, and there's a plaza in the middle, and of course the telephone line, I think is what it is, um, or telegraphs, something like that that's coming in over there. But so yeah, it's a it's a pretty fantastical view, um, <laughs> as it were. But it it's an interesting presage for what for what will come uh, in the future. Part of what enables everything, of course, is our water supply. You can only push so much water from the Sankey uphill. Um, kind of hard to do, and there's not enough to do everything that they wanted to do. And they had exhausted all the other water supplies that they could buy into. And so the creation of the Bear Valley Reservoir, Big Bear Lake, 
which is still our water. Um, I'm glad to hear that we have two more feet in it as of last week. Uh, yeah. Created by the Bear Valley Water Company to bring water to Redlands. And it comes down, of course, by gravity all the way around and ends up in this period of time at the Redlands Reservoir, which is right there. And it is basically Ford Park today. Okay. That's what the reservoir looked like in a later postcard. Here's just really quickly, this is that irrigation map that I showed you that for the, but I'm gonna tell you about it now for a different purpose. This, uh, instead of showing you where the Rancho San Bernardino was and the Sanha or the Sankey, let's look at Redlands itself. Now, this is 1888 and what, what is being advertised here or informed here is what land could be irrigated because that's super important in Southern California to have land, right? Because it's not gonna just fill up in your rain bucket uh, whenever you need it. You're gonna have to figure out how to get it and to in order to irrigate your crops and whatever like that. So the things, the colors that are solid are lands that could be irrigated by, that were being irrigated then by some source. Uh, and then if they're not solid blocks, then it was projected future irrigation and it's hard to see here, but there's the Redlands Reservoir there. And by this map, there's the, the West Redlands Pipeline that brings water all the way around um, on the left, so the bottom of the map, and then over to the left. And that's what enables all of this section of South Redlands to be usable, um, because otherwise there wasn't any water. And I would love to know if Judson and Brown paid whoever made this map to put the Redlands land in green. Because of course green is verdant, right? And uh, so, even though other other blocks are like like in the Lagonia area, right? It's it's a solid color, but it's gray. Well, I'm not going to buy land where it's gray. I'm going to buy land where it's green. Um, but this is just one small section of that big map. Just to get it a little clearer, uh, and for some perspective, I put the U of R up there. You can see that that's the blue line right there is the Sankey. Yep. Here we have the Redlands Canal and then down to the um, reservoir and then around the West Redlands Pipeline and some of the other water that comes in, just so you can get a sense of what then could be irrigated downhill on the downhill side of that. You have to do that. And the other thing that I, I should have zoomed in on this, but do you see this section that's curved like that? Kind of in the shape of a crescent. You know what street that is? Crescent. It's not actually totally shaped like that, but it didn't occur to me until I saw this map why Crescent Avenue is named Crescent, because it was reflective of the intended shape of Crescent, of a Crescent, about that. Once they had water supplies, then you could really start subdividing all those big blocks that they had laid out into smaller, smaller blocks to sell. So this is actually addition number seven to the second preliminary map. That's from 1886. You can get now the residence plat in 1887. Uh, this is addition number eight. And now you have all of these residential lots. And this is um, Palm, Chestnut, Walnut, Highland. Um, I meant to mention when we were looking at the preliminary map and the second preliminary map, what is really unusual to me at least in my experience, about those maps. And I don't know if you guys noticed it, but South was up. Yeah. South was at the top. Now, in my very limited experience in map land, North is always up on a map. But for those maps, South was up. And I'm not sure what that's about, but I thought it was really interesting. This map, on the other hand, North is up. Well, sort of. North is that way. But... But still, it's reversed from the other stuff. So you can see a lot of a lot of new um, subdivisions going in for for residential lots here. Uh, here's a great map of a portion of Redlands Heights. This is the area around Summit Avenue. See all the lots that are that are there. Franklin coming down on the right. Oh, here's I zoomed in. How about that? Now you can see it a little just a little more clearly. Yeah. So Cajon, Franklin. Curves around more Franklin Gardens down here. And that is actually north up there. And there you can see the reservoir, right? So now Redlands Boulevard of today would be that rough street that says Road to Yukaipa. 
because it's going up Reservoir Canyon. That's how you got up there. And that's the way that the freeway goes eventually now too. Um, another example, here's the map edition number nine from 1887 to the preliminary map. And then I love this. This is still, this is called the Plaza edition to the map of Redlands. This is that intersection at, at Cypress and Center Street that in that 1882 artistic rendering had a big fountain in the middle and all of that. Because I think initially they thought it was going to maybe be the, the center of town, didn't happen that way. Um, but it was still called the Plaza Edition as late as 1887, or as recent as 1887, which I think is really interesting, which I'll show you in a second. All kinds of people, of course, came out. We had, I'm sure you've probably heard of the Chicago Colony Group that came in the mid-1880s, and they settled largely on the east side of, of Redlands. Um, of course, what's really interesting about that group and probably every group that comes, they bring something of their past with them. And so they brought their place names. Um, so you can see Dearborn and Lincoln and Wabash, which are all, of course, major streets in Chicago. And they transplanted those street names and put them here. And of course, the most famous um, contribution is State Street in downtown Redlands. Um, so this is the 1887, there is actually an 1880, late 1886 version, uh, but this is the 1887 hand brown version, hand, excuse me, hand drawn version of uh, the platting of downtown Redlands. So that's Orange Street that runs in the middle this way, and the state runs down right in the center, and then Citrus Avenue on the bottom, and uh, Water Street, which later became Central, which later became Redlands Boulevard. Uh, is the north side of this. Um, so this is the this is the map that creates what will become downtown Redlands. Now, of course, there's other stuff that's going on in the valley right now. You know, people had come out into the, the Ligonia section, the town of Ligonia, but it's really not much of a town. Uh, it's, it's like a, a loose af affiliation of people who lived approximate, lived proximate to each other. And about the same time in the late 1880s that so much of Jensen and Brown were trying to subdivide all those residential lots in the south part of Redlands. Um, others were doing the same thing in the Ligonia area. So I think this is 1887 or 1888. And you can see a number of these are familiar street names. You have Alta, Times, Herald, Tribune, Post, right? Those are the streets, Terrace Avenue, Colton, and then up to Brockton over here. And I think they're calling Orange Street commercial, right, and across. So this is also happening there. So you have these two competing developments. So now you have that 1887 map of the town plat of Redlands. It's the downtown thing. This is only not that far above um, on, the, on, the, on the big map, right, up, up the street. And so you have a really smart, smart person who's coming in to develop some of the land in between it. And he's and it's called the subdivision is called the link because it is the link between Redlands and Lagonia. And I'm going to turn it sideways so you can see it a little easier. So that's Orange Street from Redlands Boulevard, Central Water, take your pick. And then North Park, Stewart, High, Pearl, and up to Terrace Avenue. And it's the this is the map that then connects that town plot of Redlands with the subdivision map I just showed you of Lagonia. But in addition, there's other things that are going on here. To the far west, you have the Terracina colony, which never really took off. And you know, one day, magically, the hotel burned down. Uh, a little bit to the west and north, you had beautiful Mentone. Yay. I often think of a, of a beautiful, beautiful day on the Mentone Riviera. Uh, <laughs> Named, of course, for Mentum France, right? I love some of the other things that you find, especially in these promotional maps. So this talks about the productions of the vicinity. You could grow oranges, limes, lemons, pomegranates, grapes, both wine and raisin. <laughs> Apricots, nectarines, peaches, olives, walnuts, dates, figs, bananas, apples, blah, blah, it gets, goes on. Clearly you could grow anything here. And then the attractions of the vicinity. Mentone possesses a delightful climate with warm days, cool nights, and pleasant afternoon breezes, and free from the frosts of the valleys. It possesses an independent water supply, pure from nature's filters until Lockheed. And in abundant quantity, a fertile soil 
peculiarly adapted to citrus trees, the fruit now growing being unexcelled for quantity, size, and quality. It's altitude about 2,000 feet. Anyway, there's all these other kinds of interesting things, and you can sort of see some of the, uh, the visual representations of the area around the frames. Very similar, this is and now an updated version, sort of, uh, of that 1882 bird's eye view. This is 1888, and now, of course, Redlands is actually more developed. You can see downtown Redlands here. The difference here is now we are looking south. That other map was looking north. And you can see Mount San Jacinto in the far distance, uh, which is, I think, an interesting choice, too. But uh, what I like is it also you know, names prominent buildings around town. So you can see. And of course, you still have Sankey running through the center of the street. It's just now running the opposite direction. But one of the other great things about this is you can really start to see the intersection of the two street grids. So you have the, the true-ish north, south, east, west street grid that is everything basically north of Citrus Avenue. And then you have our, our funky diag on a diagonal from that street grid that follows the topography that is to the south of that. And so you can really see that clearly here. And just to give you a, a close up, because nearly all of these intersections have been re-engineered over the years to eliminate their interest but probably make them much safer, right? That's, I'm sure, what it was about. So this is the intersection of Cajon, Orange, and Citrus. Orange Street used to go one block further south than it does now, um, and Cajon Street continued straight until it hit Citrus Avenue, and in this particular example, what was left was this little tiny piece of land in the, in the middle of where those three streets intersected, and they called that the triangle. I like to joke that in most towns have a town square. In Redlands, we have a triangle because we got to be different, right? We're Redlands. Um, and there's a fountain there in the middle. Actually, when this piece of land was deeded to the city, it was with the provision that um, it always be maintained as a public watering place. We actually have photos of the fountain that was there in the collection at the library, uh, which is pretty interesting to see. Um, of course, over time, things changed. The, the oak tree was planted um, for a celebration at one point, and then the street gets re-engineered. The telephone building takes over this portion over here, and now we just have, a, now it's not a, really a triangle anymore. It's a corner, um, but it's, it's Triangle Park, so at least we're acknowledging its past. Most of you won't remember this intersection, but this is the similar kind of thing that happened where Brookside, Citrus, and First Street met. Um, this now was underneath, basically, where the safety hall was. So that all got re-engineered at that time uh, in order to construct safety hall and finished in 1962. With some of these other maps, you can just see how quickly development happened. And what I wanted to show here, this is one of those Sanborn maps that Tom mentioned early on, is that the Sankey was running right through what became downtown Redlands. And that's there at the top. I should have brought you a color version. That's state in orange. Here you can see a slightly later uh, year as things were progressing in terms of growth. And the Sankey is still coursing through town. You see this little section of it right over here, which created things like this. Oops. Hello. The buildings built right over it. Yeah. That all got re-engineered in the 1930s, um, but pretty interesting. This is that 1890 map that Tom mentioned that was done by Isaac Ford, and it's a really, really um, accurate depiction of the town at that time. And you can see it's very clear that all of the major um, streets were laid out by 1890, you know, 133 years ago the framework for Redlands was already in place. And I'm going to toss it back to Maria. OK, so Nathan talked about the, the growth of the town. And of course, once that started to happen, the need for a local cemetery be, became very quickly apparent, um, which led to the creation of Hillside Cemetery in 1886 on land that was originally purchased by Judson and Brown from the Southern Pacific Railroad. The first person to be buried there was an early settler and Civil War veteran named Charles Gauthier. And the this is, you can still see sort of, this is still part of the layout of Hillside today. 
the cemetery is about as twice as big as what you see there. Um, and you can kind of see the growth in this map that was created in the 1930s. The map we saw previously was from the late 19th century. And here by the 1930s, you can see the familiar circle there, but it's grown substantially. Now, what's really interesting about this map, it was created uh, during the Works Progress Administration's time here as they were working on Hillside. Um, and of course, it, it gives you some very interesting information, but then of course you see that in the middle of the map, it shows that it's undergone, undergone some sort of trauma at some point. So it was, it's mostly intact, but it was burned uh, in a fire. So has anybody heard the story of or has anybody seen this map before? Or does anybody know the story of what happened to it? So it's very, very interesting. And Nathan, of course, is the one who introduced it to me. So to explain, let's look at this photograph of Redlands First City Hall. So it was built in 1892, and the structure seemed to be already old and outdated by the 1930s when the Works Progress Administration uh, was doing their work. As many other communities were successfully applying for new municipal structures, a petition was submitted for the WPA to build a new Redlands City Hall, but it was rejected because the city already had a functioning building. And it seems like fate intervened in 1939 when a mysterious fire destroyed the original building, creating a legitimate need for a new structure, which was built by the WPA. Uh, just like they originally wanted. And as you are well aware, the structure still stands today. It's the police annex, which is in downtown or just you know down the street from here. Fortunately, some records were saved from the place, which included the, the map that we saw previously. So that's just a fun story, but it is getting ahead uh, of what, where we're going right now. So we're gonna move back just a little, little bit. Now we can't discuss maps without uh, discussing the importance of Sanborn maps and Tom did a great job of telling you about Sanborns and how um, they're such a vital source of information for understanding the development of communities uh, across the country. So they were produced as fire insurance maps and they are really are an incomparable resource to track subtle changes in communities from business turnover in a storefront to physical changes in buildings. They also show uh, social changes in the makeup of neighborhoods. These maps show the size and shape of constructions of buildings. They also tell you the widths of streets and the, and the names of streets, property boundaries. They give you so much great information. They really are an unrivaled source uh, for that. I, for um, cities across the country. Um, and, but they also, as I said, they tell you a lot more specific information about the town. So they show where people worshiped, how they lived. They reference the racial and cultural makeup of neighborhoods. And by tracking this data over time, Sandburn maps provide a window into how and when neighborhoods really changed. So here we have two examples showing uh, locations of houses of worship that, are, that no longer exist. So on the on the left, you have the Second Baptist Church, which is located at Eighth Street uh, and State, an area which uh, in which many minority groups lived at the time. The church was built in 1892 and served the Black community in Redlands for many years. We don't have any photographs of that, but it's it's wonderful because these maps really allow us to know where this was, who who was where people were worshiping, where they were living. To the right, or to yes, to the right, is the Templo Evangelio, which was a Methodist church for Latin American residents that was located on Kendall and Central. And this seems to have been a short-lived enterprise that, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know, we don't really have too much information about. But by tracking its inclusion in the maps over time, we get to learn about you know, when it was there, which then kind of gives us a jumping off point to be able to do research and, and learn more about the people who worship there, um, you know, how long it was there, and just more specific information like that. So the, this ability to show change over time is one of the reasons why these sandworm maps are such an important research tool. So we'll take Redlands Chinatown as an example of that. While the Chinatown neighborhood is known to us to having um, been uh, right off of Eureka Street, in the earliest parts of Redlands history, Chinese residents lived and worked elsewhere in the city. So this 1891 map identifies the location of Chinese laundries in those early years as being in what is today uh, 
downtown Redlands off of the Fifth Street and Water Street, which of course Nathan mentioned is, um, is Redlands Boulevard today. So it's basically on the site of where the tartan is. And this is confirmed by the advertisement, which is seen to the right of the map, which has a Water Street address. By 1892, Chinese residents were concentrated west of that in what is Eureka and Oriental today. And as you can see, Oriental Avenue was not yet in existence during this, this early period. The street was designated about a decade later. And here you can see in this 1908 map, along with the addition of a Korean laundry to accompany the Chinese launders, you, um, you can see that on the map as well. And as some of you may know, the neighborhood was eventually abandoned with the last resident leaving in the early 1920s. But as this 1938 map shows, although the laundries were removed earlier and the buildings were vacant, um, they did remain there for several years. And the photograph to the bottom right is believed to show the buildings, possibly during the period after the Chinese residents left. And it's likely that these structures may have been used by other groups during that time. When we are able to put all of these pieces together, these maps really bring to life the stories of the community. Um, the communities that made up Redlands. Other maps can help supplement that information or the information that we learned from Sanborn. So for example, here we have um, a 1907 map showing the, um, the depot or the area, the site of the depot for the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe. And in addition to the details it provides about the depot site, you'll notice this map also identifies the Chinese quarters as well as the Chinese mission. Uh, which was in existence from about 1900 to 1900 to shortly after this map was published. The map also, sh also shows the location of a Chinese garden in Chinatown, which is something the Sanborns didn't reference. In addition to that, it also identifies the location of frame dwellings and Mexican shanties, which is something you may be familiar with, um, you know, from past efforts to learn more about the existence of the Mexican community that lived there. You might recognize it from this map, actually, if you've seen this before, um, because the lot, oh, sorry, excuse me. So the that Mexican community appears here in this 1925 Sanborn map of Redlands. Now, because this lot fell outside of the area that was originally included on those Sanborn maps, it did not appear until about 1915. And so that map we saw earlier was kind of the earliest example that we had of, of information that there was a community in this spot. The community only appeared in the 1915 and 1925 Sanborn maps and was gone by the time the next maps were published. So while we know the majority of the city's residents lived in homes just north of this and would have been listed in city directories um, and business listings, this informal neighborhood referred to here only as the Mexican checks would not have had the same trail of records to tell us a century later about the people who lived there or how they lived. So it really makes these really um, particularly especially, especially valuable for researchers. So we've touched on this before, but in addition to providing information about the location of places and people, maps also provide a window um, oftentimes into the perspectives of the people who are making the maps. Depending on the focus of map makers, maps can be skewed to emphasize certain areas or elevate specific groups over others. And Tom referenced this when he said that maps are not always 100% um, truthful. So this eye-catching pictorial map was created in 1938 for the Golden Jubilee. And uh, if we look more closely, the illustrators have made very deliberate decisions about what to include and how. And this is not something that's unusual. If you look at maps throughout history, they're telling you a story from the way, the, the perspective of the map maker, how they wanted you to understand what you're looking at. So for example, as you see on the top left, the people who illustrated this map chose to depict Mexican Redlanders engaging in a stereotypical Mexican hat dance, along with the House of Neighborly Service and Lincoln School, which were two institutions that catered to that segment of the community. And that same image, same image you have an African-American woman performing domestic duties while dressed in the way that mammy or maid characters were shown in films and theaters at the time or movies at the time. The city's black churches are included around her. Um, and it appears that there's also an, like an exaggerated depiction of a black child there as well. So these types of decisions 
by the people who created this map really serve to color the perspective that viewers have about the content that they see. So it really kind of makes it important to really analyze what you're looking at, think about it from the time period and it was made and what they're trying to tell you. So while it, this is an artistic map, obviously, it can easily be described or dismissed as being subjective. It really does tell you, tell us again, a lot about the time period in which they were made. But it's very interesting, of course. Um, they also chose to include other uh, features in Redlands that the map makers were Alice Gay and Gage, um, Alice King and Gay Johnson. Uh, and they included a lot of sites that were significant to them, their friends and to themselves, like their friends' homes or the churches where they worshiped areas of recreation, like the Sylvan Plunge, which is seen on that, the top right there. So of course, you know about Sylvan Plunge. Here we have um, an illustration of their, their layout for the plunge. It was built in Sylvan Park, of course, as you all probably know. And it was a municipal pool with a very long history in Redlands. It opened in January of 1923 and was an important recreation center for the people in town. So many people have vivid memories of the plunge. Some people learned to swim there. Clara Mae Clem, who some of you may have known, became the first female lifeguard there in the 1940s. Um, but of course, there were more difficult stories that we can also learn about, uh, about the plunge, specifically that it was not fully integrated. As seen in these printed rules for the plunge, and as many people later remembered, the pool was only available to people of color on Mondays which is the day when it was cleaned. So these stories are likely not unfamiliar to you, but they really do shed a light on what it was like for people in the community um, in, the, in the past, and in the pretty recent past as well. It hasn't been that long. While this was just one of many segregated sites within the community, the solution that was found was to construct a second pool for the people of color. And that was, of course, a floral plunge, which was built in 1938 on Texas Street in Oriental, it was a WPA project. Um, and it catered, of course, to the people of color, as I mentioned, from this community. But as you can see in this portion of the 1955 Sanborn map, the pool was not constructed in an idyllic par public park like Sylvan Plunge, but in an industrial area of the city that was near the railroad tracks. And as you may know, in addition to the plunge, movie theaters were also segregated and there are stories of white trade only signs that were that barred people community minority community customers so it's kind of important to remember all of this and what we can learn about mass what they tell us now nathan is going to pick up the story from here i'm going to try to power through this okay i know right got to get through it's, it's cocktail hour somewhere um one of the, we cannot underestimate the importance of tourism as a, to our city in terms of its development. And what put Redlands on the, literally on the map um, was the existence of Kenyon Crest Park, which was the Smiley's estate. And so this map of a portion of what Redlands Heights actually centers around Kenyon Crest Park. And I'm gonna show you here, this is, I've outlined the property that the Smiley's owned. And of course that dark line that runs through the center is Crest, Crest Drive. Um, where you could, you know, get off the train downtown and get on a tally ho and get on a tour and it would take you through Canyon Crest Park. And you can see we got, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of postcards, it seems like, have been sent with images of Canyon Crest Park on it. And it was sent, of course, all over the country and the world and drew people specifically to Redlands to experience the park that the Smileys had created. Here's one of those tally hoes coming through town. Of course, railroads also being in the business of, you know, carrying people wanted to promote ridership and tourism is a great promotion of ridership. And so they advertised uh, their own different routes. This one is the, Southern, the Santa Fe's route that they call it the kite shaped track because it went in this figure eight, sort of the shape of a kite. The Southern Pacific, or excuse me, the Pacific Electric Railway had this massive electric railway system that terminated in the east in Redlands, and you could take the, uh, oh, there's there's Redlands there and all the little different lines through town at one point. Um, you could take the Orange Belt Special, or later it was called the Orange Empire Trolley Trip, and it would, of course, come through Redlands. 
Oop, there it is. This is a map that was created by the Redlands Chamber of Commerce. And actually, we don't did not have a print of this, but fortunately, Chris Alvarez, when he was the director of the executive director of the Redlands Chamber of Commerce, discovered this printing plate in the chamber's stuff. And he brought it down to the library one day. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. I wonder what it looks like. And it happens that I'm one of those weird people who has a printing press in his garage. <laughs> So I put it on the on the bed of the press and inked it up and got out some paper and and made a, a print of it. And I was like, wow, how cool is this? This is a tourist map of Redlands. And you, you can't really probably see it very well, but there's all these little numbers around. And those would were um, there was a legend over there I've, the, where it says Redlands Chamber of Commerce. That's typed that I set because there's this big empty hole there. And I thought I needed something, but that's where the key would have been to all of these other things. What do you think I think is so cool about this map? South is up. Okay, so this is somewhere based on the streets and the buildings that are in existence here. This is somewhere around 1908, um, in part because it says college site. It doesn't list the name of the university or that there is a college there, but it's the site. So I think it's sometime between 1907 and 1909 when this is created. And I got to thinking, why is this tourist map south up? I think that just seems very strange. But then it, here's what I think, this is my conjecture, is that this map was created, you got off the train at the Santa Fe Depot and or the Southern Pacific Depot and very close to wherever you were was the Chamber of Commerce office where you would go and pick up a map because you've never been in town before. And from where you're standing, you're gonna look at that map and it's going to tell you to go uphill, right? Because this, this is where all the stuff to see is, is around there. So it, it's from the perspective you would have standing in downtown Redlands looking south. That's what I think. Because, But it's interesting. We do have a version of this from like two or three years later, and it is north up. So someone made a decision to change that. The automobile comes around, right? Suddenly we have this new problem that you didn't really have with like horses and buggies called speeding because automobiles can travel very quickly. And so what this map shows is the 12 mile per hour speed limit zone for downtown Redlands. So that's what the kind of orange reddish thing is. That's where you have the 12 mile an hour speed limit right through the center of town. And then of course, we all love the auto club. Probably most of us are members of the Southern California Automobile Association. Um, but of course, the ones who were initially put out things like speed limit signs and directional signs and stuff like that. Um, this is a, a they think we call it AAA now, right? First, the part of AAA. Anyway, this is the Orange Belt City's roadmap through town. And here, of course, is the blow up of Redlands. Smiley Heights, of course, called out specifically in this map, what I think it's 1916. Um, but you see the, the major roads, and those are the really heavy, heavy lines through town. That's where you want to take your car. Big, big changes come because of the automobile. In the 1930s, there was a move to create a highway that would come through Redlands. Uh, eventually, we called it Highway 99. It's today's Redlands Boulevard. And this is how it was carved out of the existing city. So to the west of basically First Street, um, it went through land that was not a street before. In part, it went through the city dump, things like that. But then when it got into town, in order to create enough width, they had to condemn um, sections of existing buildings, existing business blocks. And so basically the south 42-ish feet of Central Avenue, Redlands Boulevard today, was demoed in order to create the highway. So that's the west end. There it is through the, uh, the east section of downtown before it curves through in order to then go up Beacon Street, basically, but that's now also still the highway. But you can see in this map how much of Redlands was demolished to build the uh, highway. And I was thinking about this actually the other day because I have nothing better to do. And it occurred to me that the creation of this highway demolished at least as many buildings as the construction of the mall, for the mall, I mean. 
Because I mean, look at all these blocks that are that are included on both sides of the street and the entire buildings that had to come down in order to put the highway in. And I would say that the creation of Highway 99 had at least as much of an impact on the um, the built environment of Redlands as the, the construction of the Redlands Mall did. But we don't really think about that. And then, of course, other maps that show us interesting change. This, of course, was trying to figure out where to put the freeway and all the different proposed routes that could have been taken. Um, this was early on from the about 1955, I think. And so they, they had an option that would have gone north of Lagonia Avenue and curved down. Uh, an option that came, that's basically the one that, that they chose that was right through Central. They call it the Central Redlands route there. Um, then you had one, the South Redlands route that would have gone, it would have basically taken out my old house right through the center of town and then up Reservoir Canyon um, or through Santa Mateo Canyon and then met up over there in Yucaipa. So it's interesting to see all the different potentials that they could have had. But of course, what they did choose is to demolish neighborhoods north of Colton Avenue or just south of Colton Avenue and then cut through town that way because the central business district owners worried they were so used to the traffic that or the business that Highway 99 generated uh, because they had to come through town that if people if the freeway went outside of the business district well they weren't going to stop and I don't know buy a pail in my hardware store I'm not sure um, but of course what that meant was okay we demolished everything to bring it through the middle of town entire neighborhoods um, those people did not get off the freeway to buy their pail or whatever it was right they kept going to Palm Springs um, so Anyway, interesting thing that these maps can tell us. We just got a couple more, so if you'll hold on, I promise. We're gonna get right through. Maria's gonna, gonna turn it back over to Maria. All right, very, very quickly. So the maps you've seen so far have shown the growth and evolution of the community and really allowing us to kind of piece together this story. So an important part of that puzzle, of course, um, is the creation of the, the school system here in Redlands. So this early map shows that in addition to Redlands District, there were also uh, Lagonia, Crafton, and Railroad districts very early on in the late 19th century. Uh, Lagonia was the oldest. It was created, formed in 1877. Then you had Crafton in 1882, and then Redlands came a couple of years later. So these consolidated to create a Union High School um, which was originally in the Wilson and Berry block up in Lugonia until a permanent school was constructed uh, at Citrus, Fern, and Reservoir, which you see there. Obviously, Reservoir is Church Street today, and that was built on land that was, was donated. Roosevelt, sorry, Roosevelt's day. So by the early 1940s, when this map was created, a growth within the region had resulted in many different school districts. Um, you have Falls, Fallsvale, Mission, and Yucaipa all uh, in this region. And within Redlands alone, Redlands actually had two different school districts, one for the elementary school, another one for the high school. And uh, in 1963, Redlands Unified School District was created um, in order to uh, obviously unify those two districts, but also to save money for the city, because apparently it was very expensive to have two different school districts. Yucaipa Unified at the same time which was uh, kind of required for Redlands to do it because there was so much overlap in students um, within the different local districts. In addition to these local schools, the University of Redlands, of course, also looms very large in terms of education in the city. And so Nathan's gonna tell you more about that. Okay, I, I love this. It's, it's not a, the traditional kind of like roadmap that you would think of. This is the site plan. Uh, this is part of the university's collection. It's in the university archives. This is the site plan for the administration building um, from 1909. And what's really cool is that it shows what was existing, the Stillman House, the winery building, how the trees were laid out, the Sankey running through. Um, and then it superimposed on top of that where the ad building was gonna go. So you can you can see the administration building is that is that red uh, red outline right in the middle, roughly uh, on top of the Stillman home there. So you can also of course see the topography and everything. But I really like how much how much detail there is down to the different types of trees in this map. Um, 
It's very cool. So the original is in, in the university archives with the role of uh, drawings that were used to create, to construct the ad building. And I want to say it's like 13 pages. You, you could buy, you could build like a shed anymore and it's probably 80 pages of drawings, right? The entire administration building was like 13 pages in 1909. But I love this, this site plan. It's so cool. This is a great map. It's intended to be a semi-secret map. This is the student map to senior hall, <laughs> right? So you could go on the, the magic ditch day stuff. And so Marie and I sat down with, with, the, with the drawing, trying to figure out what all the streets were, right? Um, so we start out on Colton Avenue, we go to Church Street, then we come across um, Fern Avenue to Center Street, to Crescent, to Alessandro. We take Alessandro past the cemetery because you can see the little cemetery markers, right? <laughs> so you know where you are. You go down into the canyon, you cross the railroad tracks, you come down the canyon a little more, you cross the railroad tracks again onto Live Oak Canyon Road. And it says, uh, I don't know if you can see it, it says two miles, but somewhere it says two miles. And it shows a little suspension bridge there, which is the Alessandro Pipeline suspension bridge. Shockingly to me, it shows up on a Google map. If you go to Google Maps, I can't see the, the su suspension bridge, but the place name shows up on the Google map. It's amazing. And, and we measured it out and goodness gracious, it was two miles. It's like, wow. Uh, so then you, you cross the suspension bridge and you go up and down into the hills. And then there was a series of ruins that were up there. And that's, there are actually photos in the university's collection of students doing whatever students do, I guess at these ruins at Senior Hall. And it was like, I don't know what, Larry, was it like 20, 20 years or something that this was a thing? Yeah. There's a whole page about it in the uh, history of the university written by Dr. Larry Burgess called, oh, sorry. I was gonna try to plug your book. Okay, other kinds of maps that show up. I've only got a couple left, I promise you. This map uh, is from 1957. I sort of feel like it was a place map, right? And I, but the, the purpose of this was to advertise the new Citizens Bank that was at 7th and State. With the building, of course, is still there. It's now the Wells Fargo. Um, and then with the highlights, or, or what we would think of today as the landmarks of the town uh, around it, just kind of cool. And then this map that was created, um, Oh, I, was, I meant to write down what it was. What did we decide? It was like 1990 or something like that? Yeah, another one of these artistic type maps of town uh, that was commissioned by the university to show. Um, so, and then you can tell all, of, all the companies that, that paid money to advertise on the map, I'm sure, because they're, they're highlighted by their name. But I'm sure there are places, there are restaurants and things on here that, that some of you will remember. Uh, I do love that the, the scale is very different between the scale of the university on the right half <laughs> and all of the rest of Redlands on the left half, right? But, I mean, but that, that pretty well brings us up to date. So, so when we think of maps now, we probably think of these digital representations that we either get on our computers or on our phones and that can show us any any number of different things, especially if you're using something like ArcGIS that has eight billion dollar, eight billion points of things that tell you all kinds of stuff. And I'm not a cartographer in that world, but I know several of you here tonight are. You can see what others can't. That's, I'm sure that's an inside thing for Ezra. Um, but it really is amazing how we how we have evolved in terms of cartography from, from those earliest maps that we saw and representations of the built environment to where we are today in this unbelievable technological world of map making. Uh, so with that, I wanna thank you all for being here this evening. I hope... I hope this has been interesting. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we're not going to take questions tonight. So I hope you will indulge us in that. 
I know my students in particular would really like to leave. So we will see you guys next Monday back on campus. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the society. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we really have a wonderful partnership between the Historical Society and the, uh, the archives. Mm -hmm. On our website, we have a lot. Uh, if you go under resources, um, under resources, then we have a section on historical maps, and you can also um, access the Sanborn maps, and that was all uh, due to the uh, scanning that the archives did and uh, the ArcGIS program, so we're proud of that. So next month, Tom is going to be our speaker, and you're going to talk on? Before and after Redlands. We're going to show you pictures of Redlands homes when they were built and what we've done to them since. <laughs> this is part two. I started last year, but I'm a little slow, so I'll get to part two. So on your way out, we have refreshments, and then we have... Um, old history books and uh, other material that you can um, purchase and we'll see you next month.